hello um good evening and welcome to this bookmarks live stream and this evening we're talking about the paris commune that incredible experiment in how workers could run things for themselves and today is actually the 150th anniversary of the fall of the commune and so we know that the commune lasted all too briefly before it was crushed but it still remains i think a source of hope for revolutionaries today um you can watch this talk on facebook or on youtube and um, if you are watching on facebook uh, please share the live stream so we can encourage more people to watch it um, so we have two speakers this evening uh, we have the author david constantine who's one of common press's short story writers and he's going to be reading a little bit from his, uh, his short story which is called living in hope and we have a historian donny gluckstein um, author of the book uh, the paris commune a revolution in democracy. Uh, we do have, um, I think, a bit of time for questions from the audience at the end. So um, if you're watching this live, do put your questions in the chat and we'll um, ask the speakers to address them at the end. But um, yeah, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to our, our speakers, David and Donny. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to be here. Um, I first came into contact with the commune in uh, 1971 when I got my first job as in, in a university in Durham and in those days you were encouraged to lecture on almost what you wanted within the syllabus and I lectured on Brecht's Days of the Commune and read of a very great deal around that period and the Commune itself then and there were lectures in celebration and also in very critical consideration of the event the events themselves and it's never left me. I was just saying to Donny then, whenever we go to Paris, we go to the Mur des Federés and lay a rose on the on the wall. It's one of those things that once you've ever come into contact with, you don't ever lose, couldn't really, I suppose. Um, this is the 150th anniversary and it was on my mind. And Ra Page then, a very great um, instigator and encourager of, of stories um, on topics of his choosing often um, suggested a volume having to do with the commune and and uh, that coincided with my with my renewed interest and well, obsession really uh, with it the story is called living in hope and it's quite a long one um, it begins with a research a researcher an academic in in paris and what i want to say afterwards in conversation with, with, with don is to try to make distinctions between the sort of truth that history tells and the sort of history writing tells and the sort of truth that fiction aims at i'll read the first six pages of it which is about 15 minutes Dr. Victoria Okolovitz, lecturer at the University of Gdansk, on a year's study leave in Paris, had found a small and affordable flat up under the eaves in the Rue Jouy Rouve, with a view from her bedroom of the Parc de Belleville. She was writing a book on the Paris Commune, dealing particularly with the women, their active shaping of it, what they wished it to do, and what it was stopped from doing for women's lives. So, a study of what women gave and desired and of their struggle, defeat and disappointment. The material of this subject has been greatly increased by research in recent years and day by day, with a passionate confidence, Dr. Okolovitz was realizing her idea of it, her hopes in it. She had quickly discovered a network of helpful scholarship other women and men working from a variety of points of view on subjects more or less connected with her own. She had sociable meetings in cafes and bars. One or other of the universities and colleges hosted a fortnightly seminar. She felt herself to be creatively in touch. And when she emailed home, they could tell she was happy. There are such phases of life, if you are lucky, days, months, when everything seems to assist in the shaping of yourself. A purpose clarifies, it attracts what will further its development and flowering. 
glorious such a making. And if you are lucky, it will be a measure, an orientation, all your life long. It will have settled in you as a capacity for faith and trust. And this achievement is far removed from selfishness or being self-satisfied. A person living as Dr. Okolovitz was living during her first months in Paris will quite unconsciously, never give against a thought, encourage others. But then, born in a Chinese wet market and very soon crossing frontiers worldwide, came plague. And with it, a gradual revelation of the dealings of people with one another and with the world. And many of these relations soon looked questionable and some, for good or ill, looked unlikely to survive. Anxiety took root. Older citizens looked furtive and mistrustful. They veered away from the smiling faces of the young. They developed a sort of sonar feel like bats to swerve aside before collision. Don't come near, don't touch, don't breathe on me. Waking in her flat in the Rue Jouy Rouve, as the year advanced, Dr. Okolovitz heard ever more birdsong. From the rooftops, from the trees in the Parc de Belleville, daily, daily, more and more and louder, confident, exultant singing. Except for ambulances, the streets had largely fallen silent. In the skies too, the traffic had all but ceased. She pushed open her shutters, the whole morning light came in and she lay a while listening. She knew this to be one of the changed relations. Never in her life before had the earth been so open to listening. The noise of the city seemed for once to be in a proper propor proportion to the rest of creation. It felt for some weeks that even a vast conurbation might be livable with. Paris, with her many gardens, her flowery ruelle and impasse, her countless cherishingly watered window boxes, her river, her fountains, slowed down for a while, hushed, as if she hearkened and attended now to what had been missing, lost beauties of scent and sound. Might this not be a thing you would never again want to be without? Fearful at the outset and in continual contact with her anxious mother and father in Gdansk, Dr. Okolovitz, before long, began to sense some benefit in the state of siege. As an only child, she had developed resources of self-reliance. She was, she said, quite good at being on her own. And besides, she was not a friendless stranger. They knew her by now and liked her in the quartier. That network was still more or less intact. You must keep your distance. If asked by a policeman, you must produce your permit. But every day in your own locality, you show yourself and exchange signs of life. And the workplace, the web, worldwide, continued pretty much as before. She had most of her sources to hand, access to more through links, documents already downloaded and safely stored. When the talks and seminars moved online, with general agreement, they became weekly. Being virtually together was a good deal better than being together not at all. And they extended themselves, they crossed frontiers, they managed times and time zones to accommodate as many colleagues as possible. Dr. Okolovitz's subject possessed her more and more. She would learn, clarify her thinking, write. The plague would go away or become manageable, and by the time the old freedoms were restored, she would have finished her book. Meanwhile, good to be en situation and face up to what it entails. The commune lasted 72 days. Adolf Thiers, would have liked by massacre to entirely extirpate it as a social possibility. But he was a realist and knew that in practice, however bloody, he would have to settle for less, a further generation or so of power in the hands of his class. Then more trouble, no doubt, and another restoration of order. 
In the chronology of her book, Dr. Okolovitz stood on the threshold of the end, but she had reserved till now as a sort of pause in hope, an account of the discussion of the women's union, the social laboratory of the commune during April and May, and the demands they wish to see pass into law. She would hold this interlude aloft to be contemplated on the brink of its drowning in blood. She began with the fact that the dominant attitude of mind in working class women then was resignation. They believed their situation to be hopeless. In that fatalism, they abetted their own oppression. And to give some idea of what women were up against, not just in themselves and from the usual enemies, the church, the schools, the legislators, Dr. Okolovitz added a few thoughts from Proudhon, a supposed comrade. Though men and women may count the same in the eyes of God, they are not equal, cannot be neither in the family nor in public affairs. Woman is a pretty animal, but an animal. She is as greedy for kisses as a goat is for salt. It is absolutely necessary that a husband impose respect upon his wife, strength, foresight and industry are his and in none of these can a woman equal him. A woman cannot have and look after children if her mind, her imagination and her heart are preoccupied with political, social and literary matters. And after him, in simple juxtaposition, she placed some statements of the basic principle of equality between the sexes. Louise Michel, Recognizing the equality of the two sexes would be a glorious breach in the wall of human stupidity. And the struggle in defense of the commune is the struggle for the rights of women. The Hungarian Leo Frankl, the commune's delegate for work and trade. All the objections produced against equality of men and women are of the same sort as those which are produced against the emancipation of the Negro race. First, people are blindfolded, and then they are told they have been blind since birth. He was wounding defending the barricade in the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Antoine and saved there from capture and certain execution by the founder of the Women's Union. Elizabeth Dmitriev. The Union of Women discussed and announced its priorities. The right to work and for equal pay. Eugène Varlin, four years before the Commune, had stated as incontrovertible, no one has the right to refuse women the only means of being truly free. That means was work. Equality entailed the right to work. To women as to men should go the honourable appellation, worker. The right to take a full part in the commune's combats, including membership of the National Guard. This right was inherent in the full title of their organisation, the Union of Women for the Defence of Paris and the Care of the Wounded. And how they fought. 120 of them held the barricade in the Place Blanche, and they served as field nurses, Cantinière dressed as ordinary working women. Citoyenne Lachaise is remembered, attached to the 66th Battalion at Meudon, the 3rd of April. She was all day in the fighting, alone, tending the wounded without a doctor. The right to pensions for the widows of soldiers killed fighting for the commune, whether legally married to them or not, and similarly for their children, legitimate or not free and complete education for children of both sexes, immediate and total suppression of all faith and religious teaching for boys and girls in state schools. The union wanted rid of the vile and malign teachings of the black brotherhood of the priests who, when order was restored as consecrators of massacre, led the monied classes in thanksgiving. The opening of schools for the professional education of girls. The opening of public creches and kindergartens. Equal suffrage. 
Initially, Dr. Okolovitz added that it was 1945 before French women first voted, then deleted that comment. She would leave it to readers themselves to hold up the union of women's demands against present realities in France and Poland and other more or less developed democracies. Altogether, she wished her historical account of the Paris Commune to make for a continual juxtapositioning of then and now, of the women's revolt then and now in my country and in yours. How far have we got? How far still to go? Writing in a locked down city, the pandemic going from strength to strength, no vaccine in sight, and the scientists already warning that the virus was clever and would mutate. Dr. Okolovitz felt sure of herself. She had amassed the evidence. She would present it to her audience with all the force and clarity at her disposal and rest her case. How will you live now knowing this? Asking that question, she rose from her desk and went into the bedroom to look down over the park. Much of the last day's fighting had been in Belleville. In the Rue Romponneau itself, the last barricade fell. Through the half-open window, she heard birdsong from among the trees in the park, empty of humans. The shrubs and the clumps of flowers in the neat borders seemed to be wondering what degree of disorder, what blooming for the sweet sake of it, they might get away with. Then turning to go back to work, Dr. Okolovitz caught sight of her face in the dressing room, in the dressing table mirror, and it halted her. A small face, the pure oval shape of it framed with close black hair. Around her throat, she wore a thin red scarf. If asked, have you not become rather self-regarding? She would have thought seriously about the question and answered, no, I don't think I have. But meanwhile, the first look of the face in the mirror, thoughtful, calm, had vanished. And now what she saw was an anxious puzzlement. Rising from her desk after her rhetorical question, how will you live now knowing this? Going through to the bedroom window and viewing the self-delighting trees and flowers in the locked park, she suddenly felt that she had asked in a public and grandiose sort of voice a question she had no right to put to anyone but herself. Oh well, she thought, it doesn't matter. I'll delete it and nobody will know. And she took up her bags to go shopping for lunch and supper. On the street, however, where everything was familiar and friendly and people were making the best of a bad state of affairs, Dr. Okolovitz, first in a wondering, but then in a more and more troubled fashion, began to feel, so to speak, shadowed by all that she had learned of the events of a century and a half ago. She felt with a stirring of dread that in every savage detail they had settled and rooted in her and lifelong they would infest her. She would never be free of them. And before she returned and let herself in again and climbed the stairs to her safe little flat, the shadow had become a presence, something palpable and the easy rhetorical question addressed to the putative readers of her account was hers and nobody else's to answer first. Indeed, it shifted into something clearer and more fundamental. Will a life of your own survive now, knowing this? Dr. Okolovitz had signed up to give the next talk by one, which left her 10 days. Next morning early, still uneasy, she resumed her work. She must write about the end and the aftermath. All the material for it was marshalled in accessible notes and references, and even more so in her head and around her heart, in her waking and sleeping life. Every morning she woke, travailed by it. In deep steep it worked in her. Surfacing, she felt herself borne along in the rapids of it. Sitting down at her desk, she felt the shadow, the onus of it. She must pace herself, not do too much in one session, walk fast and as far as possible in the daily hour allowed. She was still prepared to believe that by writing and speaking to others about it, she would cease to be at its mercy. Three days later, 
Having observed her own rules of moderation and got on pretty well, Dr. Okolovitz logged in to hear a paper whose author and topic she had been too preoccupied to take note of. So it shocked her to discover that the speaker, a young man, was a compatriot of hers who introduced himself neither apologetically nor polemically, but just by way of a premise as a devout Roman Catholic. In his talk, he said, he would bring new and compelling evidence that only by expunging the commune could Thiers establish the Third Republic. The bloodshed, in the view of several modern scholars, including the present speaker, greatly exaggerated by the subject's partisans, was necessary and justified. The building of the Sacré-Cœur was not an act of expiation, but a celebration of the glorious triumph of the Church. Dr. Okolovitz felt her chest tighten, her breathing quickened. She felt she must quit the meeting at once or become very ill. She stood up, drank a glass of water in the kitchen, walked through into the bedroom and stared at her face. Partisan, she said, so be it. Seating herself before the screen, she faced the plausible young man in Warsaw and gave him her cold attention. She heard him out. He had an elderly, patient manner. He seemed assured that his audience would agree with him, if not at once, then after mature reflection. As soon as he was done, not waiting for the questions, certainly not wishing to ask any or enter into any discussion, Dr. Okolovitz logged off. She would work, work late, answer back quickly and with the needed edge. The elderly young man had clarified her purpose. Thank you, David. Um, I really like that part about giving the uh, online talk a cold attention. Um, and in fact, also for talking about the women of the commune, like people like Elizabeth Dmitriev and, um, and Louise Michel and others like that. I think it's important that we also hear about their stories. Um, so I will hand over to, to Donnie to talk a bit more uh, about the, well, to fill us in a bit more on the history and the context of this. Thanks. Okay, so um, I, I want to pick up in a sense from where David leaves off, which is that he he talks about how the commune, he got the historian, everybody should, everybody should read his story, it's really excellent, goes on to talk about the relevance of the commune for today and sort of brings it up to date in those terms. And that's where, the, where you know, his reference to then and now, I think, is, is so important. And there are huge parallels between what happened in Paris and what's happening in Britain today. I mean, if the, for the disaster of the Franco-Prussian War, which was launched by the French government in 1870, uh, produced uh, a siege of Paris. And the result of the siege of Paris was lockdown of the economy, where we heard that before, uh, mass, un mass unemployment uh, as a result of that, uh, public health crisis, uh, because no food is coming in, et cetera, et cetera, even down to a furlough schemes. I mean, the, the, the Parisian... Uh, in this Parisian situation, due to the mass unemployment, the in virtually the entire male working class was enrolled in the National Guard to protect, to, to sort of patrol the walls of the city to stop the, the Prussians getting in. And that was a giant furlough scheme. Uh, and the Paris Commune ended, uh, begins actually, when the government plans to abolish the furlough scheme and put nothing in its place. So there's, there's many parallels. Now, David also dealt with, or his his professor <laughs> from Poland dealt with the question of the uh, Bloody Week. And today, the 20th of, of May being the, the, you know, 150 years since the end of Bloody Week, I think it's important to try and understand why it was so brutal. Just to give you a sense of the brutality, there were something like 30,000 people killed in, in one week uh, in Paris. Uh, this was far more than any of the battles of the Franco-Prussian War, which was an international war uh, you know, between two major countries. Uh, compare it to the number of people that died during the, the famous terror of the French Revolution, 2,627, not 30,000. The intensity of it, the brutality of it needs to be explained because in the same way that what's happening to Gaza and Palestine has to be explained, to do, it's to do with the Zionist project of apartheid and so on. The, the, the reason that the French ruling class was so brutal towards the communards needs an explanation. And I think Marx gave that when in his civil war in France. And he said very simply, 
It was, it was the form, this is the Paris Commune, the form at last discovered with which to work out the emancipation of labor. And that was what terrified the ruling class. And I just want to describe very briefly what this form was uh, and how it would emancipate labor. So first of all, it's, this is not a sort of tinkering reform. And I'll read you a quote because what happened on the 18th of March, which is when Louise Michel and the women on the, uh, the, the Montmartre Heights re repulsed the attempt of the French government to, to seize the National Guard cannon. This is, this is what happened, a quote from the time. We had no more government, no police force or policemen. They all ran away to Versailles. The entire state decamped from Paris. No more government, no police force or policemen, no magistrates or trials, no top officials, no soldiers, no generals, no managers of the postal service, so no post, no tax collectors, no teachers. In those days, teaching was a middle class profession. No professors, no surgeons. So literally, the government had gone. And so the working class of Paris, and those are the people that are left, the rich had cleared Paris during before the siege. They weren't going to hang around and fight to defend the capital. Um, the working class is there, and they recreated a whole entire society and ran it for themselves very successfully. Just... Uh, so gas supplies, water supplies, rubbish collection, everything. And another quote, during the commune, not a single man, woman, child or old person was hungry, cold or homeless. And when you compare that to current society, the, the, it was a miracle. And the, and the miracle, because it was in very tough conditions, was because of the equality, the sharing of people working together. And since we're at the, you know, the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, the argument about defunding the police they did extremely well without the police in Paris. Uh, There's a huge decline in crime uh, completely, a few robberies and not a single murder during the 72 two days of the commune. But that all sounds quite abstract. I just want to give you one sort of, uh, a few sort of practical examples. Take the, the case of Nicolas Dugène. He was a national guard. Now he lived in a, in a, a tenement block and his landlady attempt to evict a neighbor because she couldn't pay the rent. He turns up with a squad of guards. Now, these days, you would expect them to be evicting the person. No, this was the opposite. He said, the boot is now on the other foot and the need for somebody to have a house over their heads is more important than your property rights. And that's what happened. So no eviction takes place. Um, some of the things... That, it was mentioned that the, the commune only lasted 72 days. Um, and some of the things sound quite strange. Uh, some of the things that Marx picked up because there wasn't a lot of time to do things. And one of the things he picks up on is the abolition of night work for bakers. And you might think, why, why pick this out? Uh, and I'll just give you the quote that, um, that uh, comes from the time, from the commune itself. It's, and the, the, their argument, they said, you cannot make workers who are people like us only work at night and never see the day in the interests of the aristocracy of the stomach. Fr French bread goes off very quickly and so the bakers were being forced to work at night so that you had fresh bread and croissants in the morning for your breakfast. And the commune said, that's inhuman, it stops now. But they did grander things than that. Um, so on the 24th of April, the decree handed over the workshops of owners who'd run away to Versailles gave it to the workers, and the workers ran it democratically, elected all the posts, recallable on a fortnightly basis. This is what the brutality of the ruling class is. That's where it comes from. They are terrified of this sort of thing. I won't talk at all about women, because I think David's, uh, even David's brief reading of the section of his, his, his uh, story covers that so well. I just want to talk about education. Um, that's what I do. Uh, it's what I'm paid to do anyway. Um, and I'll, I'll read you from the Boris Johnson of the time, uh, David referred to him, Adolf Thiers. And he said the following, I hate anyone who teaches that man is not here to suffer and puts forward the philosophy you should be happy. Because if you think you're entitled to happiness, you will strike at rich people fearlessly for keeping you away from it. So his, his attitude to uh, education was, you know your place. That's what it's for. This is what the commune says. Again, a quote. The aim is to enable everyone, and they're talking about boys and girls here, because girls hadn't had education up till then, mostly in France. The aim is to enable everyone to be able to work, but also to develop as an individual. 
The person who wields a tool must also be able to write a book. They must be able to relax and enjoy culture without ceasing to be productive for the common good. What a transformatory view of education. I'll move on to art. Um, the Artist Federation, headed by Gustave Courbet, who you might know, the, the French um, artist. Um, and this, Harvey Weinstein comes to, to mind when, with this quote. Those working in the theatres are exploited from top to bottom. The female dancer is forced to sell herself to live. But from now on, the theatres will be run by the artists themselves. That's what the commune did there. And as the museums and palaces are reopening due to the wonderful uh, Tory programme of vaccination, actually it's provided by the NHS, but anyway, um, this is a quote for, again from the commune. This is what you would see when you, when you go into the palace, uh, uh, the Tuileries Palace, um, in, this, in, 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 in Paris, this is what it said. It said, people, the gold which exudes from these walls is made up from your sweat but now you own what you created. So even to the museums, uh, the, the, the transformation and the ruling class hated it. Moving on quickly, um, I want to talk about the internationalism because, and, and David touched on it, uh, Leo Frankel was the delegate for Labour. He was born in Hungary. He was the head of the German section of the international. Remember, they'd just been at war with Germany uh, months before. The delegate for war, most important post in because the commune is under attack from the very beginning, initially a US citizen and then a Polish citizen. And the Union of Women that David mentioned, headed by a Russian. And the final thing in this point, which before I get onto the actual structure and the democracy of the commune itself, was um, the Place Vendôme. Place Vendôme had an imperial column. Think of Edward Colston in Bristol. The imperial column was a symbol. It was melted down cannons that Napoleon I, Napoleon the Great, had collected and melted and created this horrible column. They pulled it down, and this was the quote. The imperial column in the Place Vendôme is a monument to barbarism, a symbol of brute force. It will be demolished. The commune didn't bring in a police bill to protect statues above human rights. No, they brought they, quite the opposite. They demolished the Vendôme column. So how was it done? How was it that people are going to emancipate themselves. And this is the evidence of the sort of emancipation that we're seeing. Really three things I want to talk about, three levels. The first one is the mass activism. The commune was the people acting for themselves. And I'll just read a quote again, from Rue Drouot up to Montmartre, the boulevards have become a permanent public meeting where the crowds fill not only the pavements, but spill over into the roads to the point of blocking the way to traffic. Everyone is discussing, debating, and shaping their own future. And during the daytime, that's what's going on. In the evenings, they've moved into the churches. And I'll read a quote from the communal club of the third arrondissement. And there are 16 arrondissements in Paris. Uh, and they used to meet in the church. And this is how it went. In the morning, you have mass, baptisms, marriage, confession, and burials. But when the night falls, the red flag is put out onto the altar and the mass meeting begins. And what the mass meeting consisted of was five to 6,000 people. And what they would do is they would interrogate the members of the communal council to discuss what has happened during the day, what decisions have been made, whether they agreed or not. This is accountable power. The second element I want to talk about is the, is the furlough scheme, the National Guard. So mass unemployment for the male workers of Paris. They're given a small uh, income uh, as part of this furlough scheme, uh, but it's a very interesting organization because um, every platoon, every section is itself a permanent mass meeting. They're, they're sitting at the walls, reading newspapers and debating. They elect their officers and the junior officers elect the senior officers and it all goes up to a central committee. So mass democracy at the base and uh, centralized control at the top. And Leon Trotsky looking at this from in the Russian Revolution said that actually this was the closest thing uh, previous to the, to the Russian Soviet that there had been. The Paris Commune had been creating that in the Central Committee of the, uh, the, the National Guard and that, that whole accountable, instantly recordable democratic structure. So that, in a sense, is why the ruling class absolutely detested the Commune. And I just want to finish on, on, on really two, two things. People might remember uh, Margaret Thatcher's famous quote, 
There is no such thing as society. Now, one thing that the pandemic has shown us is that actually there is such a thing as society. People work together, club together, organize together, need each other, need to help each other. Uh, you know, that's, that is how we muddle through. That's how we will get through. And what the commune did brilliantly was to bring together those organizational aspects of society that, that we are a society and that through working together, we can, we can storm the heavens, as Marx put it. However, what it didn't do, what it expunged and drove out to Versailles was the repressive element of the state. Because we are stuck with Boris Johnson might be rolling out the vaccine, but also he's got the police bill, he's got the rolling out the racism, he's got all of those sorts of things, the billions in test and trace money that goes to Dido Harding and Serco, and all of this sort of stuff. In other words, what they did was they got rid of the state as a repressive, exploitative class body for the ruling class and retained the organizational power of, of human society. And I think that's, that's why the brutality of the, of the bloody week took place. And while we, there's a lot of questions about the politics, and I'm not going to go into that. If people want to ask questions, they can, about how we ended up in bloody week, why it was a defeat. Uh, it's, it's a valid question. What we should also celebrate on this, the 150th anniversary, despite the, the bloodletting and the, the, the dead, let's remember what they achieved. They did storm the heavens. Thank you. That's me. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, I'm going to pass back over to, to David now, but uh, if people are watching and if you have questions or if you have comments or anything that you want to ask speakers to talk more about, then do put your questions in the chat. Uh, but before that, um, over to David. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, Danny, thank you very much indeed for that. Very much. Um, in fact, that's the part of your book. I got your book today, as I said, and that's the section I, I read. So I'm, I'm well instructed now. Um, listening to you talk and reading a lot of history, and I, my brother is a historian, and my son is a historian. I've always been aware of the differences between writing fiction and, and writing history. Um, the good thing, I mean, the blessing about fiction is it's not the job of fiction to be fair. Life isn't fair and fiction is not asked to provide an account of a life or of lives which functions as to say, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. I think writers of fiction are especially interested in both, I should have said at the outset, history and fiction are interested in truth. That is, you're no good at either and you're not fit for either. You're not fit to be practicing either unless your aim, your responsibility is understood as telling the truth. Telling the truth in fiction is doing your level best to understand what the situation you've chosen and the people in that situation, what their life is like. As a writer of fiction, as also as a writer of, of poetry, you, you can feel it in yourself if you start wandering off into something that's easier, been said before, is rather too black and white, and that's the point when you realize that you're sliding into untruth. You're betraying the project, you're being false to it and to yourself. So the whole um, responsibility of fiction and the, the, the difficulty of it is, is listening really, is, is keeping listening and watching your people and keeping close to the truth of them. So I was glad of the moment when um, Victoria Okolovitz there stands in front of the mirror and says, partisan, so be it. Uh, she's actually going to be writing something which is uh, verging not to fiction, she's a sound uh, historian, but she knows which side she's on and she's she is uh, prepared to utter it and stand by. And of course, this is a story I'm writing. It's a story about a, a woman actually who's blessed with the sort of heritage from the commune in the, in her 
Polish family's tradition, she is actually the descendant of the Pole who climbed the uh, Vendôme um, and threw off the statue there. So she has this heroic past and she views her parents as having had a heroic uh, revolutionary past in, in, in Poland as well. And that interested me a lot. And I got working, as it were, for her, assembling the material that she would need. I got ne necessarily further back into the historical truth of the commune. I suppose what interested me then as well interested is the wrong word that there comes a point when as a writer you begin to feel rather at the mercy of the truth of what you are writing rather than the director of it so the obsession the sleeplessness or not sleeplessness it's kind of worse than that it's a sleep which is entirely inhabited by what you are writing you get no rest from it it's like being in a state of permanent rapids the rapids of of dreams and it's necessary i don't regret it it's just what it's like when a when a subject is um, important i think and important to me and i think should be important to a lot of people as the commune seizes hold of you i understood with relation to victoria um that it's it's fathomless there's really no end to it and um as, as, as donny said there what's quite hard i think for people to understand is the absolute savagery of one class against another. It's fear and loathing, and I shan't mention any of the details, you can read my story, all of which are historically true, the worst. The worst is always true in this, in this story, in that sense, historically true. There's an extraordinary visceral loathing of another class of person. In fact, not just a few, not a minority, but the bulk of the population, the large working mass of the population is viscerally loathed by those people in charge of it. Loathed out of fear because they know they are outnumbered. We are many, ye are few, as uh, Shelley well says um, after the massacre at, uh, at Peterloo. Fiction frees you up to offer slants on things which are odd and within the writing of the fiction itself are full of contradictions, are full of things that you wouldn't be allowed to, as it were, just put like that. You'd need more chapter and verse and all the rest of it. So I was interested in, if you like, the fate of a young woman caught up in something which was clearly vastly important to her with her upbringing and to her as a citizen of the world as well. And the second half of the story is her attempt to, and I think it, I get the feeling it's, stories are usually open-ended, but the, the ending is, is not unhopeful and the, the title of the story is, is precisely living in, in hope. Thanks. Thank you. Uh Donnie, did you want to did you want to add anything as a historian? Yeah, no, that's very very interesting uh, points you raised, and I, I just want to. You talked about fiction. I want to talk about history writing, um, because you mentioned quite rightly the that. Well, you you sort of hinted that there might be a distinction between fiction, which is not you know not ne not necessarily true in the in the sense that it happened and history uh which has to to sort of stick to historical truth absolutely the case but what i think we have to be clear about is that there is not in history uh undisputed truth um what is true for one class i'm going to argue is not true for another you can see it in in many many ways um take for example and we can see it re very recently think about the impact of the black lives matter movement and the whole question of slavery, colonialism, and all the rest of it. Now, the truth had been known about slavery and the role of the British and Colston and all of these things for decades. It has become, in a sense, a mass fact. It is something that is accepted across society as the truth now, the horrors of slavery and all those sorts of things. And that has been achieved because one class, one group of people, you know, and uh, the you know, Bain communities and people with them and all the rest of it got together and said, 
we don't accept the ruling class version of what has been going on. And ruling class history, the glories of the British Empire, and that's what's been pushed at schools, through schools and all that sort of thing. That's what they want to push back. I would say is, is a complete distortion. It doesn't mean that sort of a Marxist historian or somebody uh, who sees it in, in more class terms is not looking at the truth. We look at the truth, but we have a particular view of this because we think, when I say we, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I think Marxist historians have a view that actually all interpretations, there's an element at the time of, of who you are, who's speaking, from what class you are, and therefore what elements of the truth you will select and put into into uh, you know into your book into your speech into your lecture whatever um i think that actually marxists have to tell the truth and i'll, I'll tell you what i mean by that you see and let's take the commune as an example i talked up if you like i don't think talked up but i presented one side of the commune which was the inspirational uh, side of the commune absolutely true now, that's why i read quotes didn't make them up the, this is from the time there's another side to it. The commune was a disaster in the sense that on the, the week before, on the 21st of May, the, the troops of Versailles were able to walk through an undefended gate in the Paris walls and massacre, as a result, 30,000 people within one week. And the political mistakes that had led to that point are terrible, and we actually have to tell the truth about them. So while on the one hand you hold up, and I think absolutely justifiably, the inspirational aspect of the commune, I think we have to be extremely critical about the other side, which was the politics of the, the commune. And I'll, I'll just mention two things. Number one uh, was the anarchist position, which is the autonomous position, which was basically the state has gone away to Versailles, therefore we can forget about it. We don't need to do anything around it. Uh, and therefore they didn't, Propose, they didn't suggest marching on Versailles. They didn't suggest doing anything to counter uh, the, the build-up that Versailles would be able to achieve and come back and smash them. They said, forget about the state. We don't, we're not interested in the state. We're anarchists. We don't think about it. No politics. No leadership. Uh, the, other as, the other side of it were the, the Blanquists. And the Blanquists took their name from uh, August Blanqui, who was a, a very important figure, actually. Um, he, he gave the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat to Marx. Marx borrowed it from him. And Blanqui believed that the working class should run society, but he thought the working class were not clever enough, not educated enough to be able to do that, achieve that for themselves. It would have to be given to them by some dedicated uh, individuals, you know, a, a small minority of conspirators who would seize power and hand it to the working class. And the problem with that approach towards politics is, of course, if you are conspiring and you, you're basically collecting guns for, the, for seizing the offices and the, and the um, government buildings, then you don't tell many people about it. It's a very small organization. So the Blanquists were a tiny minority of people. And when the Paris Commune broke out, the, the revolution 18th of March, Blanquist supporters were saying, we have to march on Versailles. The enemy is just 10, 15 kilometers away. We have to stop them. Otherwise, they will come back and massacre us. And because there were just a couple of hundred of them, and the Parisian working class was hundreds of thousands, they were completely drowned out. And that is, that's the tragedy. Now, that's, it's a very difficult truth that the commune completely cocked up their own defense. But it has to be said. So in a sense, we're, we're working through, uh, you know, I think we stick to the truth, but I think we are, my view is that it's, there is a class truth and we are the mass class and we have the truth. The ruling class has to lie to justify their existence. Um, and you can see it in climate chaos. You can see it in the pandemic. You can see it in everything else. So I think it's a very interesting point that you raised about truth and objectivity, difference between fiction and, uh, and history. Thanks. That's me. Uh -huh. Thanks, Can Tony. I, um, yeah, go ahead. Just, just quickly. Um, I suppose the advantage of fiction is what well, she says, partisan, so be it, and she can she can afford to do that, or I can afford to do that with her. It's it's the truth from a point of view. And then it, in the second part of the story, it has to deal with other points of, of that is to say, her way of being in the world is actually seriously questioned by the woman 
and in, intrinsically by the two small children that she meets in the second half of the story. But what a story f writing fiction frees you up to do is is deal with particularities, actually to follow one slant in it without feeling that you have to keep saying this is only one slant, this is only one view, it's a class view, or it's, it's what you're interested in a particular human line running through it, a particular sort of person, and you want to see, and I don't know at the outset ever, that's quite important, I suppose, to say. I don't know at the outset because it's it's happening as I make sentences. So I've heard of writers who sketch the whole thing out and then, as it were, just write down what's already there. But the writers I've really revered have been the kind of writers who it's coming out of the fountain pen or whatever. You can this when, when Lawrence was dead, uh, Frida Lawrence remembered his hand the hand moving across the page with the pen in it sitting under an olive tree writing very fast three full versions he did of lady chatterley's longer didn't fiddle around with it but again there was another attempt and then another attempt to get closer to the truth of the original commission if you like so writing is is you're in pursuit of the of the truth of this fiction which has seized you rather than you as it were deciding on on it and that leads to all sorts of waverings and odd slants and um i'd insist on the absolute rigor of both kinds of writing i suppose I, rather than just talking about truthfulness one has to talk about the rigor of 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 the discipline the rigor of the discipline of history or or of any um, scientific subject absolutely so robert graves is um as Professor of Poetry in Oxford, was absolutely insistent to the, to the people he was speaking to. A good poem has to be as rigorous as the most rigorous science. Now, rigor we could talk about all night, but I understood what he meant then, and I've tried to keep to it since. There's a, there's a rigor in your undertaking, and it, it expects of you the highest possible, the closest possible attention to see where it is going. So it's not a, as I say, I don't know the end. And most of the, the writers I like best also, I feel at the outset, don't quite know where this is going. Thanks. So we've got a couple of questions and then um, I think we'll finish up after that. But uh, I guess we've got one question about art and how the commune is represented. Um, they're saying, how do we bring together these kind of events with those creatives using more modern forms of art? How do we get these events to modern audiences who might engage differently with storytelling? So I guess that's a question about, uh, you know, how can we get these events more widely known um, today, 150 years on? And another question, uh, you both give a sense of monumental loss of the defeat. Um, what's another outcome possible for the commune arts? Um, perhaps you might both like to say a little bit about that. <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> I mean, I think Donny's Donny's made it's made again and again the, the, this point that this hasn't gone away. This this may have been a a, a catastrophic failure in a certain sense, but it, it's simply not gone away. It is a, a a point of orientation for for people who think about how us what a just society might look like. could just add uh, people not everybody realizes this but every time the internationale is sung that is a celebration and a reminder of the commune because the words were written by Eugene Potier he was one of the communards uh, he's buried in Père Lachaise very close to the Mur des Fédérés where they were shot and if you read if you read the verses and people should read the verses actually it covers the entire story of the commune it really does bring it alive uh, and the commune has lived in um, in a whole number of different forms. There's one, I forget the name of the director. Uh, La Commune de Paris is um, a sort of semi-documentary, stunning documentary style. There's stories. David's uh, story brings the commune alive again. So, there, you know, I, I think it is, it, is, it is there and with us. In terms of the question about um, could the, the end have been different, 
this is always one of those historical ifs. And in a way, uh, it's it's not all that fruitful to play that game. But I think what we can say is this, that while we're not, I don't think anybody would imagine that you could, would have had a world socialism growing from the Paris Commune spreading out uh, and overthrowing capitalist society at that stage in the game. The Commune could have certainly um, extended its life and also built itself uh, rather more. Just to, to give you a sense of this, the one of the difficulties that the Commune had was that the, the siege was unique to Paris. Nowhere else had been through that experience. And so when people tried to uh, get the National Guards in other cities and get the other places to rise up in, in the way that Paris had, it just didn't resonate. Uh, and that was a that was a problem. So they tried it in Lyon, they tried it in Narbonne, they tried it in a whole number of places, and they just didn't they just didn't take off. But what the commune could have done is it could have bought itself time, and it could have negotiated, if you like, uh, a, a settlement that didn't wasn't just complete massacre. And that was the mistake about the the march on Versailles. Just to explain this, the Paris the, the National Guard had something like two hundred fifty three hundred thousand people at the beginning of the commune. The French state had something like 25,000 soldiers. The reason the French state only had 25,000 soldiers was because most of the army had been captured at Sedan by the Prussians just before. And so literally, um, the, the Versailles state was very, very weak. And so it was that fatal mistake, that lack of political leadership at the key moment uh, when the commune, commune had to make the decision to march on Versailles that, that proved really, really fatal. Uh, and so it's, it became disorganized. The other side built up its forces. And so the, the, the brutality was there. The ruling class will always be brutal. The ruling class is a brutal class because their interests are, it's about capital and money. It's not about human beings. But when we fight back, even if we don't smash them, we can make a difference in terms of the way that they operate. Anybody who's been on strike for a pay rise knows that. You know, they would like us to be living on bread and water, if that, uh, you know, uh, in hovels. Actually, people maintain their living standards. That's why it's interesting to read today that uh, trade union membership has gone up during the during the, the pandemic because people see the point of organising in, in this situation. And that's what we need more of. Now, I'm not a reformist. I don't think that will solve the problem. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, the commune could have done something to have, have helped itself in terms of not just being crushed so brutally by the state. Uh, did you have anything to add, David? Yeah, just, just very briefly. I can't remember who said it, but it's, it's certainly true. It, it refers to um, to Christianity, actually. The, the, and the, the truth that I remember somebody uttering is that heresies never die. They may be suppressed, very violently suppressed, and the, the advocates of them are butchered one way or another, but they remain as possibilities. They can always be, they come back to life themselves or they can be resurrected. And it's the same with, with ideas altogether. It's certainly the same with political ideas of going way, way back of how you might, I mean, this is the, the social question, clearly, how do we organise? ourselves for the good of the many and that's and the various notions and whoever's in power will approve or disapprove and and will try in some cases as i said with reference to tier at the outset it really was an effort to extirpate a whole idea and this is not odd the german national socialists um, actually if you think germany was the most highly civilized civilization country in Europe and in within five six months of Hitler's seizure of power actually democratic ascent to power <laughs> ascending to power they were back into barbarism they were on the slope into an utter barbarism so that's always now that what they had to do to get there was actually and this was an intended policy more or less carefully or loudly uttered, actually to extirpate, that means to fully undo and render, put it into a condition from which it would never survive again, come back to life. The whole humanist tradition of Germany in the 18th and the 19th century, the whole flowering of what's called Weimar 
humanism, Goethe, Schiller, Hölderlin, all the rest of them, this, this um, European-wide, no sense of any, of any uh, borders of country. Actually, Goethe is the inventor or the putter into use of Weltliteratur, a world literature. And National Socialism, exactly the opposite of that. And it sets out to eradicate that as a possibility in our human dealings. And it didn't succeed. Did its level best, but didn't succeed. Thank you. I think that's a, a good point to to end on that they haven't succeeded in in crushing those those ideas. Um, so uh, thanks everyone that's been watching. Uh, David's book is called Living in Hope, and or David's story. And Donnie's is the Paris Commune: A Revolution in Democracy. And you can buy the books we've been discussing tonight and many more radical and socialist books at Bookmarks the Socialist Bookshop. Um, it's open now on one Bloomsbury Street in central London, or you can order online, of course. Um, on the Facebook page and on YouTube, you can watch the video of tonight, or you can watch videos of past events, uh, including Palestinian cultures of resistance, which is the one we had last week. And you can also stay updated on future events. So next week, it is the launch of Breaking Up the British State, a uh, new book on socialism and Scottish independence that you can also order and buy from from bookmarks. So hope to see you back again again next week.